Well, uh, first of all, uh, good evening to everybody, or good afternoon, depending upon your viewpoint and the clock. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Joe Rayo, and it, quite possibly I uh, spent the better part of 21 years when I was the chief meteorologist at News 12 Westchester in Hudson Valley, coming into your living rooms or television rooms in the evening and overnight hours to provide you with weather information. Uh, I'm right now kind of in semi-retirement. I'm doing a lot of stuff, uh, though I'm not on the television anymore. But what I can tell you is, is that um, what we're going to do tonight is not talking about weather. We're going to talk about a very special astronomical event that's coming our way tomorrow morning. And I'll tell you how special it is. Uh, I did some research and found that the last, that over the last 150 years, we have only had something like this happen in our area twice, back in 1875, September, and 1959, October. And that is, have a considerable amount of the sun covered by the moon, at least three quarters, and in this case, tomorrow morning, is gonna be four-fifths of the moon, four-fifths of the sun covered by the moon, uh, coming up at the moment when the sun is coming above the horizon at sunrise. If we have a clear morning, and I've got my fingers crossed, we have a clear morning or semi-clear morning, you're going to see quite a sunrise, a sunrise that you probably will never see the likes of again in your lifetime. It's a PowerPoint program that I'm presenting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. And then I'm going to uh, go to slideshow and go to start from current slide. And we'll be off and running with our talk here about eclipses of both the sun and of the moon. So you see on the screen right now, our nearest neighbor in space, the moon. And hundreds and thousands of years ago, man looking up at the sky believed that what they were looking at was a goddess, a goddess by the name of Selene. And even to this day, when we uh, have people who uh, make maps of the moon, who look at the uh, lunar valleys and craters and mountains, they are known as selenographers after again, Selene. We also have in the sky another important uh, object that's during the daytime and that is the sun. Primitive man saw it as a God. He realized it was necessary for his life and all life around him. He worshiped the sun and he feared the night only hoping that the sun would return on the morrow. He feared the coming of winter hoping the sun would bring him a return to warmth. The movements of the sun were beyond man's understanding. We thought at one time that what we were looking at was a ball of fire that was being trailed across the sky on a chariot ridden by this guy, the god Apollo. So we had Apollo during the day, Selene at night. And one thing that we feared most, more than anything, was the possible disappearance of either the sun and the moon. When there were those occasions when they suddenly appeared to dim or disappear, we thought that there was something up there in the sky, uh, some kind of physical being even more powerful and more potent force. One of the earliest chronicles, one of the earliest stories about this dates back to China, 41 centuries ago. It goes something like this. The day was bright. The great sun hung motionless in the sky and above the Yangtze Valley. The Chinese storyteller records what happened next. The dragon, Lung, restless with hunger appeared and before the eyes of the frightened people. Lung began to devour the sun. The day grew darker. The people raised a din, a chant, praying, and, and, and even shooting rockets up to the sun, trying to chase away that invisible monster. The dragon apparently was startled. The sun slipped from his jaws, and Lung vanished to await another chance. Our computers tell us the date. It was October 22nd in the year 2137 BC. Well, in China back then, there were two court astronomers. What are court astronomers? These are guys who watch during the day and during the night. They watch for interesting sky objects, shooting stars, meteors during the night. Sometimes they'll see a comet. They call those broom stars or sweeping stars. Sometimes a star would appear out of nowhere. And then over a span of weeks or months, it would just mysteriously disappear. They call those nova, new stars. But during the day, when it appeared that the sun was beginning to diminish in light and even perhaps fade out completely. That was the signal that the dragon Lung was in the sky and eating the sun. And these two guys were supposed to 
tell the Chinese uh, populace that this was happening so that the people could run and uh, chase and scream and shoot rockets off at, at long in the sky to chase them away. The uh, person you see on the left is Hai, 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 and the uh, one on the right is Ho, Hai and Ho, the court astronomers, and they made a dreaded mistake when this eclipse occurred. The mistake was that they decided that they were going to have a few drinks. In fact, more than a few drinks, they imbibed, so much so that by the time the eclipse arrived, they were just flat out juiced up. They were inebriated. They were intoxicated. And they were in no shape to alert anybody about the eclipse. When the eclipse came and went, the emperor of China brought Hai and Ho before him and said, you sinned a tremendous sin. You are responsible for telling us when the dragon was eating the sun and to warn us and to tell us that we could chase it away. Where were you? Where were you? We had to do the job all by ourselves. And do you realize that if, if we weren't successful, the sun would have been eaten by Lung the dragon? And that being said, they would, all life would disappear on this planet. You too must now suffer the consequences. And this was the consequence, death. They were beheaded, they were decapitated. That's what happens when you forget to tell the emperor and uh, the people that an eclipse is taking place. Uh, you lose your heads. <laughs> well, anyway, it, not only in China, but in Japan, the Middle East, all other cultures looking at the sky were fearful about when eclipses took place because they were concerned that maybe they were going to lose the sun or the moon completely. And that could mean possibly the end of life on this planet. Periodically during this talk, you'll hear me pause for a few seconds. It's only because I'm uh, taking a sip of Poland Spring. I've been giving this talk so many times in the last few days. I'm hoping that I'll still have a voice when I finish this talk uh, in about uh, 45 minutes. So anyway, eclipses were mysterious. We threaded them. It would be nice if we knew when they were going to occur. In fact, you are obviously noting that we you know, eclipses don't happen all the time. Why is it? Why is it that we don't have eclipses more frequently? The reason is, is that the orbit of the moon is tilted compared to the orbital plane around the sun of the earth. So because it is tilted relative to the earth, what happens is, is that sometimes the moon on the high side of its orbit could pass above the sun and on the low side of its orbit, it could pass below the sun. And as that happens, we don't get an eclipse. Here's an example of that. The moon, again, passing to the north or to the south, missing the sun completely, no eclipse. On special occasions, however, the moon might pass or cross in front of the sun partially or completely hiding the sun. That's when we have an eclipse. When the moon and the sun cross, well, that's when the moon is crossing through that part of the Earth's orbital plane, which we call a node. That's what we call the crossing point, a node. So when the moon is near a node, and if it's at new moon or full moon, that's when we can get an eclipse. There's a limerick or an axiom uh, regarding uh, this, and that uh, goes something like this. Sometimes I think of the sun and moon as lovers who rarely meet, always chase, and almost always miss one another. But once in a while, they do catch up and they kiss and the world stares in awe of their eclipse. So I guess you could say that we occasionally will see Selene, the goddess of the night, and Apollo, the god of the day, get together, get it on for a few minutes, hugging and kissing while we mere mortals down on the earth use our uh, instruments, telescopes, and whatever to observe this sight and stare in awe of this majestical moment when the goddess of the night and the god of the day get together for a short interval of time. Well, man started to learn. As I said, they used to observe these eclipses and they would take note and then they would record on stone tablets as the Babylonians did. This is a record of an eclipse of the sun that occurred around 1000 BC. When enough of these observations began to accumulate, man began to notice that there was, these eclipses were not happening haphazardly out of, you know, you know, there was a certain schedule and we were able, Ban was able to discover this 
many, many centuries ago. And they, they did it through things like this. This is Stonehenge, as you are well aware, uh, built on the plains of Salisbury, England. This is how it looks today. Stonehenge has been around for about 3,500 years, and you could see weathering, wind, rain, cold, heat, snow, have kind of beaten these rocks down. But when Stonehenge was brand new, when it was first built in 1500 BC, here's what it looked like. What was it for? Why did they build something like this? Well, we know that in the middle of Stonehenge, there are a series of stones. One of these stones is called a keel stone. And in 11 days, we're going to have the summer solstice. And in 11 days, the sun is going to rise. That's the only day of the year it's going to rise above that keel stone. So maybe they built this to try to mark off the time of the beginning of the seasons. Or maybe it was that they would have the sun shine through some of the cracks and uh, corridors of, of uh, or gaps in the uh, pillars to uh, figure out when the sun was going to rise or set. And look around Stonehenge. Look around here. We have holes. And these holes are called Aubrey holes. And what, well, okay, I hope that we're going to mute that person. Uh, thank you very much. So what, what are those holes, those Aubrey holes? What were they to serve? They were 50... Four of them all around the um, all around the monument, all around Stonehenge, and they would put a rock in the Aubrey Hall as a marker, and they marked off the positions of the sun and the moon. The moon marker, well, that was moved two holes every day. The sun marker was moved two holes every thirteen days, and then there's those crossing points. Remember, I said that the moon was tilted relative to the Earth's orbit, but when it crossed through the orbital plane, and that if the moon was new or full when that happened, we'd get an eclipse. So they would mark off if it was going from south to north across that plane. We call that an ascending node. From north to south was a descending node. The marker was moved three holes every year. That gave us a clue that maybe, just maybe, this monument, Stonehenge, was used to try and help predict eclipses. Well, if you were a necromancer, a soothsayer, an astrologer, all of those years ago, you had a very important job because you were able to forecast or predict the positions of the sun, the moon, the planets, and also perhaps you were able to predict uh, or try to predict the time of an eclipse. And if you were able to go to the prince or the king or the emperor, whoever was in charge and whisper in their ear something like, tomorrow we're going to have an eclipse. I think tomorrow we're going to have that uh, invisible monster try to eat the sun. We, we have to be on the ready. You know, you had a job like that. You, you had a major job. And uh, a lot of, you know, people, a lot of uh, kings and queens and whatever, they, they had court astronomers to help them, you know, tell them when things were of interest were going to happen up in the sky. Now, with eclipses, there was a cycle that was known as the Saros cycle. The word Saros is derived from the Greek meaning repetition. And that means that eclipse circumstances would recur. They would recur at periods of 18 years, 10 and one third or 11 and a third days. In other words, if tonight, for example, we had an eclipse of the moon and it was a total eclipse of the moon and the moon went into totality at 10 o'clock tonight, according to the Saros cycle, that same type of eclipse would reappear 18 years and 10 or 11 days from now. The number of days will depend upon how many uh, leap years there were. If we had five leap years, 11 days were added. If we had four leap years over that 18 year period, then we would add 10. Let me give you an idea of how this Saro cycle works. Here is a diagram showing you the path of a total eclipse of the sun that occurred on, Jan on July 20th, 1963. Now, this area that you see, this broad zone, that's the zone where the eclipse will be partial. These lines show how much of the sun is covered. For example, if you were anywhere along this line on that day, July 20th, 1963, you'd see 25% of the sun covered by the moon that passed right over Los Angeles. So if you were in the city of angels, you'd see a quarter of the sun uh, behind the moon during the eclipse. This is the 50% line right here. So with that line, Passing over Portland, Oregon, half the sun was covered, 75% up here. And then 
Along this line, this is actually a path, as you can see, no more than 50 or 60 miles wide, starting over Hokkaido Island in Japan, going across the Pacific Ocean, then crossing through Alaska, Canada, the state of Maine, and then out ending in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. That was the path of the total eclipse of the sun. So if you want to see the sun totally covered, that's where you had to be. Now, according to the Saros, this eclipse is to return. It will return and throw the same type of shadows in the same configuration onto the surface of the earth 18 years. And since there were five leap years in that 18 year cycle, 18 years and 11 days from now. So let's see, 18 years, that's 1981. 11 days, that's July 31st. So what happened on July 31st, 1981? Look carefully at the zone of the eclipse. Look carefully at the path of totality. We go 18 years ahead of us. And yeah, yeah, the same, the same type of path across the surface of the earth. The sun, the path of totality moving northwest to southeast. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on for a second. In 1963, the shadows were passing over the Western Hemisphere, over North America. Now, in 1981, the shadow is passing not over our section of the globe. It's passing over Asia and ending just above or just to the north of Hawaii. What happened? I mean, it, it is similar in the way the shadows are configured and the way the shadow is tracking across the surface of the Earth, but it's not the same region of the world. But remember what I said, 18 years, 11 and one third of a day. Aha, one third of a day. What happens in one third of a day? The earth rotates on its axis one third of the way around. That's 120 degrees, eight hours. So in eight hours, the world has turned to the east. There's North America or part of North America right up here, but now the world has turned so that the shadows are directed toward the Eastern Hemisphere, toward Asia, toward Russia, uh, the Middle East. And that's what happens over a one Sarah cycle. You get the same shadows, but you get a different region of the earth because again, that one third of the day turns the earth a third of the way around on tax. Let's try this one more time. 18 years to 1981, that's 1999. 11 days to July 31st, that's August 11th. But remember to turn the earth at one third of the day. So one third of the way around, same type of shadows, same type of path. But now the shadow starts south of Nova Scotia, goes across the Atlantic Ocean, and now is going to go across Europe. This was big in Europe back in August of 1999, their first total eclipse of the sun in almost 40 years. And now the shadow continues and comes to an end over the subcontinent of India. Let's go one more Sarah cycle, will we? Let's go 18 years, that's what, 2017. And there were four, not five leap years in that 18 year interval. So it's not 11 days, but 10. So August 21st, 19, August 21st, 2017, bing! The shadow is now back to tracking across North America. And you remember this eclipse four years ago, the great American solar eclipse, totality going from coast to coast, from one end of the country to the other. And again, the same part of the globe, North America once again. So these shadows after what? After uh, three Saro cycles have come back. They have returned to our part of the country. Remember in 1963, this time it passed over Canada. This is not an exact cycle. And now in 2017, it passed over uh, the United States. This is another cycle. This is called the Exeglimos, the triple Saros, the turning of the wheel, three Saros cycles. And with that, a total of 54 years and 32 days plus or minus a day occur. What I'm saying to you is this, if an eclipse is going to occur over a specific region of the earth, 54 years and a little over a month later, that same eclipse is gonna come back to the same part of the globe, okay? So in other words, uh, if, you're, if you're in one part of the world and you see an eclipse tonight, in 54 years and a month later, you'll see that eclipse once again. Pretty much the same as what happened 54 years ago. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you something. Don't try to remember, I'm, I'm sure you're not going to remember, exiglimos or even the term triple saros, but I want you to remember this number, 54. 
Would you remember that, 54? Because 54 years and 32 days, plus or minus a day, that's going to play a big role, a significant role in something we're going to talk about later in the presentation. Now, what the heck is this? This is one of the most amazing things I think man ever created back in the so-called Stone Ages. This dates back to the year 200 BC, and it is the Antikythia mechanism. Well, and then put another way, it's a computer. It's a computer, it was found in Ankara, Turkey. It has been brought by Greek scientists, now resides at a uh, museum in Athens, Greece. We actually have built replicas of this when it was in working order. We discovered that this machine, this mechanism had 38 gears and a crank. And when you crank the crank, the gears would move and this machine would replicate the occurrence of the movements of the sun, moon and planets. And most interesting of all is that in the case of the sun and the moon, when you move them around, you would see sometimes the moon would pass above the sun, sometimes the moon would pass below the sun. It had built into this machine that orbital tilt that I mentioned to you uh, at the start of the program, that the moon would miss the sun. Uh, you'd either go above it or below it. This machine indicated that. It also indicated those times when moon and sun would come together to form an eclipse. So this was an amazing device. It was the first eclipse computer built in 200 BC. Absolutely amazing, all the way back then. Well, eclipses were frightening, I, I know, but they were also used or could be used for good purposes as well. What is probably the most famous eclipse of ancient times ended a five-year war between the Lydians and the Medes. These two Middle Eastern armies were locked in a fierce battle when suddenly the day was turned into night. The sight of this total eclipse of the sun, which we now know occurred on May 28th, 585 BC was startling enough to cause both nations to cease hostilities at once. And they agreed to a peace treaty and cemented the bond with a double marriage. Isn't that wonderful? Wouldn't that be great if that could happen today in this 21st century world that an eclipse could stop wars or stop skirmishes that are occurring? Well, that was the case uh, over 2,500 years ago. Another historical eclipse involved this guy, you know him, you read about him, you learned about him in grammar or elementary school, and his name was Cristoforo Colombo, Christopher Columbus to you. And you remember, he sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Actually, he made four sailings of the Atlantic and the fourth sailing to the new world, well, he almost met his end on that sailing. It was in 1503 and he found himself stranded on the island of Jamaica. His ships were damaged beyond repair and his provisions were running low. Now, at first, he and his crew were able to get food and water from the natives on Jamaica in trade for baubles, bangles, trinkets, tchotchkes. They were intrigued, the, the natives. They never saw you know, a metal bell. That was amazing. And, you know, little rings. They, they, they would trade for these little things. And the natives were dutifully bring back to Columbus and his men you know, water and supplies and food. I'm sure Columbus must have thought that a rescue caravel was on its way and would arrive any time within a few days or maybe a week or two. But as those days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months, the Jamaicans finally got tired of Columbus and refused to supply any more food to either him or his men. And now Columbus's own crew were ready to turn on him. Faced with the prospect of both starvation and mutiny, the great Italian admiral conceived of an absolutely ingenious plan. Columbus knew from his navigational tables that very soon, within a matter of a few days, there would be a total eclipse of the moon that would occur soon after the moon rose on the last night of February of 1504. So he arranged a meeting with the natives just before sundown that evening, just before moonrise and the start of the eclipse. And then he, star he announced to the natives that because he didn't like the way they were treating him and his crew, the Almighty, his Christian God, had decided to permanently remove the moon as a sign of his displeasure. Well, I got to tell you something. He timed his theatrics precisely. No sooner had he proclaimed that the moon was going to disappear than the moon popped up above the eastern horizon. And with it, there was a little bite taken out from it. And soon the bite gets larger and larger and larger. And the natives, well, they were absolutely terrified. 
And as the moon gradually diminished, they pleaded with Columbus, please restore it. They started to bring food and water and supplies. They said, please, please don't take the moon away from us, please. We, we, we need the moon for light at night. Please don't do this to us. We love the moon. We need the moon, don't do this. And as the moon became totally eclipsed, Columbus told them that, well, no promises, no promises, but he'll, he'll retire to uh, his quarters and then try to convince his God to bring the moon back. I'm gonna intercede on your behalf, but I, again, I can't make any promises, but I will talk to my Christian God and I will try to convince him to bring the moon back. Uh, he went back into his quarters and spoke with his God. You know what his God was? Do you remember the movie, The Wizard of Oz? If you do, you remember certainly this. This was an hourglass. Of course, in The Wizard of Oz, it belonged to the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> but <laughs> Columbus's hourglass was being used for a different purpose. It was being used to time out the uh, time of totality. And as he was watching the hourglass carefully, he finally looking at his uh, navigational tables saw that the eclipse, the total phase of the eclipse was gonna end in a few minutes. That's when he stepped outside dramatically and announced that his Christian God had pardoned them and he would allow the moon to return to its proper place in the sky. And you know what? Amazingly enough, it did. The shadow moved on, the moon came out of the shadow and I can assure you, Columbus had no more problems with the Jamaicans who gradually supplied Columbus and his men with all the food and supplies they needed until they finally were rescued and returned to Europe. So what is the science of eclipses all about? It's about shadows, shadows, the shadow of the earth, the shadow of the moon. If we know exactly where they are at any given moment, we possibly could use that to predict eclipses. Now, you probably remember Robert Louis Stevenson. He, he used to, he wrote a poem called My Shadow. I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me. And what can be the use of him is more than I can see. As I said, it is a very important thing to know where shadows are. I'm gonna show you now a major league baseball game that took place a few years ago at Pac Bell Park in San Francisco. It was actually a playoff game. It was between the Washington Nationals and the San Francisco Giants, both teams that the game just had begun. You can see in the upper left, 17 pitches in top half of the first inning. But now something is going to happen during this game that's gonna make everybody stop for a few seconds. And you're going to see what happens during this game. It's a very, very interesting thing happened. Listen to the commentary by the uh, announcers for Major League Baseball as this takes place. As a result of a blip or a plane flying overhead, it's two balls and a strike to LaRoche. Even Adam had to look up and say, what is going on here? That would be the blip. The lights went out. No clouds. Beautiful sunny day. It's hard enough to hit Madison Bumgarner. Okay, well, I suppose it is hard enough to hit Madison Bumgarner, but you could see what happened. This huge shadow caused by a blimp passed over the, uh, the, the ball field. And for a few moments, the ball player stopped and looked up and it, you know, to echo what the announcer said, the lights went out. Well, this is the microcosm. This in, in, is really all about what happens during an eclipse of the sun. Here's another picture of a shadow. This one, however, is not the shadow caused by a blimp. This shadow, this dark blot you see in the middle, that is the shadow of the moon cast upon not a baseball field, but the surface of the earth, seen from a distance above the earth of about 250 miles. This was taken by the Russian, now the defunct Russian Mir space station by a cosmonaut looking down on Europe in 1999. Remember I told you before about the fact first total eclipse in Europe in 1999 in about 40 years, this is a big thing. And indeed, if you were in this big dark blotch, well, Again, to echo the baseball announcer, the lights went out. It's an amazing sight. More on the eclipses of the sun in a little bit. First, I want to talk about eclipses of the moon. They are caused by the shadow of the earth, which extends out into space for about a million miles, almost, and the moon entering the shadow of the earth. Now, remember, the moon doesn't shine on its own. It shines by reflected sunlight. So when we 
block out that sunlight from the moon, the moon blacks out and disappears, right? Well, not quite, not exactly. Take a look, here's a composite photograph of a recent total eclipse of the moon. Now in this photograph, the moon moved through the southern part of the shadow of the earth. You can even see the circular shape of the shadow of the earth. Proof that this planet, by the way, is round, not square or not flat, only a, only a, a round or spherical object could cast such a circular shadow into space. <clears throat> But you also can see that the moon, when it was completely in the shadow, this is the middle image right here. Look at this. It's not dark. It didn't black out. It's plainly visible. And it's not only that, it's shining with a red or orange coloration. What's going on? How is that happening? Well, you see, when the, when the sun is down close to the horizon, when it's rising or when it's setting, you see what? A yellowish, an orange or ruddy color. Again, right near the horizon. Then as the sun dives, dives through that, it turns red or orange itself. That's because the atmosphere near the horizon is especially dense or thick and acts like a lens. It acts like a lens. And also, you remember in earth science class when your teacher took a triangular block of glass called a prism, made sunlight pass through the prism. And what happened? On the other side of the wall, the colors of the rainbow were shown. Sunlight is composed of all the colors of the rainbow. The long wave of light leans toward the reds and oranges. And when the sun is down near the horizon, those long wavelengths help to create the orange and reddish colors that, again, you see at sunrise and sunset. Well, now, keep this in mind. When you're on the surface of the moon, looking up at the sky during what we would call an eclipse of the moon, when the moon is plunged into the shadow of the Earth, What's happening? The Earth is coming between the moon and the sun. And the, the Earth is four times bigger than the moon. And in the sky, it appears four times bigger than our moon as seen from the Earth. But when it gets right directly in front of the sun, as is happening right here, instead of blacking out, remember I said that the, the atmosphere of the Earth acts like a lens? It bends or it refracts light into the shadow of the earth. And that light is that red light that you see at sunrise and sunset. So when, when we have a total eclipse of the moon and that red light falls on the moon during the time of totality, it's being caused by the combined light of all the sunrises and sunsets that are happening on the, on the earth at the moment of the total eclipse. Half of the earth can, take into, can, can partake in a total eclipse of the moon. Everywhere where the moon is above the horizon, when the eclipse occurs, sees the eclipse. And of course, that means that half that happens to be in darkness, the night side of the Earth. So if half the Earth is in darkness, half the Earth gets this chance to see the moon undergo a total eclipse. Now we're talking about a viewing audience of quite a number of people, not dozens or scores or hundreds or thousands or even millions. We're talking about billions. Billions of people on the continent of North America, South America, Central America, wherever it's clear on the night side of the earth, if an eclipse is happening of the moon, you get a chance to see it. It's very much like, I might add, going to a movie. Think about this now. You go to a movie theater, right? Get in, you sit down, get yourself comfortable. Other people come in, sit down. Pretend, if you will, that you are a specific town or city on the surface of the earth. And the other people are also other towns and cities. They're representatives of towns or cities or maybe even nations. Now, when the theater is filled, the projectionist turns down the light. Now you're going into the night side of the earth, right? Now look up into the sky, you see the moon. Ah, no big deal, full moon, it's it. we always see it. But now all of a sudden, as the moon is beginning to undergo an eclipse, what do you see? Shadows, shadows moving across the surface of the moon. And eventually when the moon becomes totally covered, now you're adding color. You're seeing the reds and the oranges and the, and, and the yellows of a total eclipse. It's just like that in the movie theater. In the movie theater, all of you are on the night side of the earth and your movie screen suddenly becomes alive with a motion picture, a movie. 
pretend that the moon, when there's no eclipse, is the movie screen. Then when the eclipse is happening, that's the movie. Well, in the movie theater, once the movie begins, there's your show. And you'll be uh, engaged for a couple of three hours. A total eclipse of the moon lasts a couple of three hours. So again, it's just like being in a movie theater. In the sky, the movie screen is the moon. Your movie is the eclipse. And you and everybody on the night side of the earth sharing this view, like being in that movie theater. We had a total eclipse of the moon two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, there was a total eclipse of the moon. Did you see it? I don't think so. You see, two weeks ago, that lunar eclipse occurred or began. The very beginning of the eclipse began just as the moon was beginning to set here in the Hudson Valley and uh, the tri-state area. So we did not see it. In fact, uh, the sun was rising in the east at the same time and daytime came. So we were on the daytime side, the wrong side of the earth. for the But if you were west of the Mississippi, if you were in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Denver, Seattle, uh, Minneapolis, all of those places did see the total eclipse. Why? Because on mountain and Pacific daylight time, they're two to three hours behind us. So yeah, yeah. So it's dark uh, out there while it was light here, but they got a chance to see the total eclipse. We did not. We'll get a chance. We're going to get another chance later this year to see an eclipse of the moon, but it's going to be an almost total eclipse. Not a total, but 97% of the moon is going to become immersed in the shadow of the earth. That'll be on Friday, the last Friday before Thanksgiving, November the 19th. And the moment of maximum eclipse will be 419 AM. So set your alarms, set your alarms. And as soon as 419 hits, throw on a coat, because I know it's going to be a lot colder then than it is out there now. And go outside, look off to the west, and you'll see the moon looking pretty much like this, kind of an orange ball up in the sky, or yellow, uh, reddish coloration. And at the bottom of the moon, a little tiny sliver of white, that's the part of the moon not in the shadow. Shining triumphantly, as I said, 97% of the moon will be in shadow in the eclipse but 3% will remain outside the shadow. And so we will not have a total eclipse, but still a rather interesting sight to see that early morning of November 19th. Now, have you ever noticed this, that the moon and the sun in our sky appear the same size? And how can that be? The moon is certainly much smaller than the sun. I'll tell you how much smaller. The sun is 400 times larger than the moon, yet the moon appears the same size as the sun. Why? Well, the sun is 93 million miles away. But the moon is a quarter of a million miles away. So if you divide 93 million by 250,000, you know what number you're going to end up with is your answer? 400. So the moon may be 400 times smaller than the sun, but to compensate, it's 400 times closer to us. So if we ever got that moon to move in front of the sun, it fits perfectly. You know, it fits perfectly and would cover all of the sun. And we would, well, wait a minute. No, that's not true all the time. You see, the moon does not go around the Earth in a perfect circle. The moon goes around in an ellipse. And sometimes in its orbit, and the moon takes about 28 days to go once around the Earth. At one point in its orbit, we say it's at, apoge it's at perigee, closest to the Earth, 221,000 miles away. On the other side of the coin, the moon is at, at, at apogee. That's on the other side of its orbit. So if it's here, let's say then tonight, two weeks from now, it'll be over here and it will be at the far point in its orbit, 253,000 miles. The variance in the two distances near and far runs about 12%. So the total eclipse I just mentioned to the moon, that happened on the 26th of May. That was almost two weeks ago. During that event, during that time, not only was it a total eclipse, but they also said that it was a total eclipse of the super moon. Look here, look here. Now, on the left is when the moon is at the far end of its orbit, apogee. On the right is when the moon, and here it's at full phase, is at its closest point, perigee. And when the moon is at perigee and when it's at full phase, that's what we call a super moon. But it's only 12% larger than the other end of the spectrum the, when the moon is far away. So it's, it's the difference between this and this is about 12%. Now, I have to ask all of you, 
does that entitle it to be called a super moon? You know, if I would have, after the talk in about 20 minutes, if I decided to go to the local pizzeria and order a pizza pie and the guy sticks the pizza in the oven or whatever, you know, the, the, how big is a pizza pie? About 16 inches wide, right? 16 inch pizza. And as the pizza is cooking, the guy behind the counter says, hey, hey, I'm starting something new here. Would you like to have a super pizza? And I'm hearing this for the first time. And I'm saying a super pizza. How big a pizza could that be? 20 inches in diameter, 25, Lord, maybe 30 inches wide. So I tell the, tell the guy behind the counter, yeah, forget about the pizza you make it. Make me a super pizza. And he does. You know what? He makes a pizza that's exactly a half inch bigger. Instead of a 16 inch pizza, he makes me a 16 and a half inch pizza. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, wait a minute, hold on here. This is a super pizza, a half inch bigger? Well, proportionately, what I've just, I'm showing you on the screen here is the same as the super pizza. The super moon is only, relatively speaking, uh, if, you, if this were a pizza pie, a half inch bigger. Yet we go into our parlance and say, it's a super moon. Well, it's a strange world that we live in this 21st century. But if the moon were at, was a super moon two weeks ago, right now, the moon is near its farthest point in space, 251,000 miles away. It's at the far point, so it's smaller than average. So tomorrow morning, when we get ready to watch that eclipse of the sun, here's what's going to happen. The moon will come between us and the sun. It will throw its long, dark, conical shadow called the umbra toward the surface of the Earth. It looks like a shadow cone, and that's what it indeed is. But take a look. Take a look at this. As the cone goes farther and farther away from the moon and it gradually tapers out, it tapers to a tip or a point a few thousand miles short of touching the Earth. So this shadow does not touch the Earth. Why? Well, I just told you. It's 251,000 miles away. It's farther away than average from the Earth. And so it's far enough so that the shadow doesn't quite get to the Earth's surface. What would you see if you were in that red zone on the Earth, right under the central shadow? You know what you would see? This is what you would see. You'd see the sun and right smack in the middle of it, the black silhouette of the new moon. This is what we call an annular, not an annual, but an annual, annular eclipse, annular taken from the Latin for annulus, which means ring-shaped. We have a ring of fire shining around the edge of the moon. It's just like, let's stick your, stick your hand in your wallet or your uh, purse and pull out a penny and a nickel. The penny represents the moon. The nickel represents the sun. Now, I challenge you, take that penny and cover up that nickel. Can't be done. Can't be done. Because the moon, in this case, the penny, is too far away from us, too small, relatively speaking, relative to the nickel, to cover the nickel entirely. So the moon is the penny, the sun is the nickel, and that's why we have that ring in the sky, an annular eclipse. And that's what's going to be visible tomorrow in parts of Canada. Oh, at sunrise, what a beautiful sight. From a fat crescent, you'll see that crescent morph into, well, I know Johnny Cash would enjoy this a ring of fire, and that will be visible. Where will it be visible? You wanna see that? It's right along this brown path that you see. These ovals is the footprint of the central shadow. And so that path starts just to the north of Lake Superior. If you lived in Northwestern Ontario province in Canada, you'd have a good shot at seeing this at sunrise. That's gonna be a beautiful sight. It also continues through Canada on up to Greenland it eventually goes over the North Pole and then vaults over the pole and comes to an end over Northern and Western Siberia. That's the track of the annular eclipse. And I know many, many people made plans to see or be in that zone, to see that spectacular ring of fire. Uh, some I know even said, I'll build my vacation around it. I'll take the wife and the kids to see this. It should be a very special sight. It's gonna be great. It, it ain't happening. It ain't happening. No, I'm not saying that the eclipse won't happen. It will happen by hook or by crook tomorrow morning. What ain't happening is going to Canada and seeing this, because unfortunately, the boundary between Canada and the United States, the border between Canada and the United States is still closed. No one from the United States can go into Canada. No one from Canada can go into the United States. And, you know, that's 
you know, even even Canada's own baseball team, the Toronto Blue Jays, they're playing baseball home games in Florida because they can't even go to their own stadium in Toronto. So that having been said, what to do? Well, first, I want to show you an animation. Here's the animation showing you how the eclipse tracks across Canada. That red oval that you see there, that's the central shadow. Look, out goes to Greenland, the North Pole. It's going over the North Pole. I, I hope Santa... I hope Santa gives the elves a few minutes time off from their toy making tomorrow so that they can go out and enjoy the spectacle of an annular eclipse. But now the consolation prize. If you can't see the ring, what can you see? Take a look at this line right here. See this line right over here? That's a very important line. Two things are marked by that line. It marks the line that delineates sun, sunrise and it also marks that time when the eclipse tomorrow is going to be reaching its peak. So the eclipse is going to be peaking at or right around the time of sunrise. Here in New York, for example, the eclipse will start at 4.15 in the morning. Well, you can't see that. The sun is still below the horizon. But in the minutes that follow 4.15, the moon will continue to move more and more across the sun's disk. Still can't see it at 4.30 or 5 o'clock or even 5.15. But when the sun comes up over the horizon tomorrow in the morning, uh, when it does finally come up, we'll see quite a sight, which will also be visible, I might add, from places like Sault Ste. Marie in Upper Michigan, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, also Philadelphia, Atlantic City, Asbury Park, New York City, Montauk, a sunrise solar eclipse. Now, you've seen a sunrise before. Everybody has watched a sunrise, at least I'm sure, once in their life. And what do you see? The sun comes up like a big, a big uh, round yellow or orange red circle. Uh, a beautiful sight, I know. You know, say, say like, you know, uh, hey, Julie, come on. Let's go to the jo Jones Beach tomorrow and watch the sunrise. Or, you know, come on, Catherine. We're going to go see the sunrise tomorrow. Let's, let's go on the top of a tall building. I know the, there's one that's high above all the other buildings in town, and that should give us a great view of the sun rising. All of these things, and every day of your life you have seen that image of a big round ball coming above the horizon. Every day of your life you've seen that, but tomorrow morning there's going to be a significant exception to that rule. Because if you wake up tomorrow morning when the sun is coming up, you're going to see something quite different than a big round circle. This is what you're going to see. Ho ho! Look at that. It looks like, well, I called it a scimitar or a sickle. Some have called it a slice of cantaloupe melon. Some have even said that it looks like a, like a horseshoe with pointed tips, but that is our sun. Our sun is going to come up with four fifths of the moon in front of it. And that is going to be quite an amazing sight to see. When is this gonna happen? 524 AM is sunrise. Eight minutes later, the sun will reach the maximum. The eclipse will reach the maximum of 532. And then watch quick because in less than an hour, from 5.32 to 6.30, at 6.30, the eclipse will come to an end. And please don't hit your, you know, you got to get up early, obviously. Set your alarm. And make sure when you get, when you get up, you don't hit the snooze alarm. I mean, my goodness. You, you hit the snooze, you wake up, let's say it's 6.15, and you look at the clock, I want to say, oh, no, no, I, I got to see the eclipse. By then, most of the eclipse is already behind you and is over. So make sure you also have a good clear view toward the East, Northeast. Maybe you might want to go down to the shore tomorrow if you know a shoreline place, or if maybe you might want to go to a, a building that has a tall view, a high view above all the other buildings in the vicinity. That'll give you a clear view of that East, Northeast horizon. These are the things you'll have to do tomorrow morning uh, to prepare and to see the upcoming eclipse. Oh, one other thing, because of the fact that the, when the sun is coming up tomorrow at 524, it's going to come up with the cusps or points of the crescent pointing straight up. Then as the sun emerges from above the horizon and as the moon continues moving on its way, the crescent is gonna pivot or turn to the left. Watch, watch this now. Look, pivots to the left. There's the maximum eclipse at 532. And then goodbye moon on its way, goodbye sun. The sun ascends, the moon continues to move away to the left or to the east. 630, the moon is gone and the sun is back to its normal self. Now, liability. Do not, and I stress again, do not look at the sun directly 
at any time during the eclipse and don't do what this dummy was doing, pointing his telescope directly at the sun. Do you know that the sun is 400,000 times brighter than the full moon? Also, the sun is radiating radiations of both infrared and ultraviolet rays. Those ultraviolet rays are what gives you a suntan or a sunburn. That's the last thing that you want to fall on the retina of your eye is those ultraviolet infrared rays. And I, you know, the funny thing is, many people believe that the eclipse is what makes the sun dangerous to look at. And I, I don't understand that. Four years ago at the Hayden Planetarium, I was taking phone calls the day before for the big eclipse that we had in 2017. And a phone call came in and somebody you know, calling in, good afternoon, Hayden Planetarium. Yeah, hi, I have a, a question about the, uh, about the eclipse tomorrow. Yes, sir, what would you like to know? I tell when the eclipse is gonna end. Can you tell me the end of tomorrow's eclipse? And so I looked up in the table and said, well, tomorrow it's gonna end at 2.54 p.m. That's gonna be the end of the eclipse. All right, I gotta go, let me write that down, 2.54. Okay, so that's the end? Yes, yes, that's the end of the eclipse. Okay, so after 2.54, then I can look at the sun? No, no, you don't look at the sun after the eclipse is over. You don't look at the sun before the eclipse has started. The sun is dangerous all the time. So there are a few things that you have to learn to do if you wanna to see tomorrow morning's show. Now, one way to do it, do you have a mirror? you have a pocket mirror? When you uh, get up, have the sun's light reflect off of a mirror. Now, if you're too close to the wall that you're doing, casting the reflection on, this is what's gonna happen. You see that the mirror is shaped like a rectangle. Well, if you're too close to the wall, the shape of the reflection is gonna look like a rectangle. But if you get far enough away, 20, 30, maybe 50 feet away, what will happen is that reflection will then turn into a circle of light. That circle that you see there on the wall is an image of the sun. And what a safe way that you could look. You could reflect the image off the mirror onto a wall. You have no problem with it. Many people surrounding you could look at the same reflection. No problem there. And tomorrow morning, when you do that, instead of getting a perfect circle, you'll get a crescent image instead because the eclipse will be underway up until 6.30. And so you'll be able to watch as that crescent uh, widens and eventually looks like a circle with a bite taken out of it. And then the eclipse will end at 6.30. So this is one safe way of watching the eclipse. Now, if you have a telescope, don't repeat, don't point it at the sun and look through the eyepiece. That is the quickest, fastest way of assuring yourself of ruining your eyes forever. So what do you do? You take a piece of cardboard and you make a sleeve that is up near the front of the telescope, near the, what we call the objective lens, right here. And then you, by trial and error, point the telescope at the sun. Now, don't look at the sun through the eyepiece, but I'm sure you'll be able to tell when the sun is in by projecting the image of the sun onto a white piece of cardboard or paper. And by doing that, and then fiddling with the rack and pinion of the focusing mechanism and moving the piece of paper forward or backward, you'll get a nice, sharp, enlarged or magnified image of the sun. And maybe large enough to show you that the sun has solar blemishes, sunspots on it. Maybe the, maybe the moon will pass in front of the sun and pass in front of those sunspots. But in any case, another safe way of getting a view of the sun, a magnified view of the sun. Or, you might have a pair of these, solar eclipse glasses. They have become very popular in recent years. And maybe some of you might've gotten one for the eclipse four years ago. Do you know where they are? Maybe in some drawer upstairs or maybe in the attic or downstairs in the basement. If you can find them, great, because they will still be good to use tomorrow morning to look at the eclipse and look at the sun. These are mounted in cardboard. These lenses are made of a plastic called polymer which reflects the light of both the visible rays and also the infrared and ultraviolet. So they're perfectly safe to use. Now, the problem of course, is if you don't have any of these glasses and uh, you, want to, uh, you want to look at tomorrow morning's eclipse with a pair of glasses, you say, oh, don't worry, I can, I can order. Now, I think it's a little bit too late in the game to order. Even if you had Amazon Prime, 
I don't think you're going to get a pair of glasses in time. Uh, if you scan the internet, you'll find people selling glasses. But um, in the same way that if you were at Yankee Stadium before a big Red Sox Yankee confrontation and you didn't have a ticket and you wanted to go in and you see some guy, Psh, hey, bud, come over here. He said, yeah, what? He says, you want a ticket to tonight's game? I've got one for you. And you look at the ticket and say, yeah, that's great. How much? $300. Now the ticket, you see on the ticket, it's 50 bucks. Normally it costs you 50 bucks for the ticket. You're being asked to pay $300. But how interested are you? How excited are you to get inside of that stadium to see that ball game? Same thing with people who want to see tomorrow's eclipse badly. I can tell you now that these glasses cost what? A buck or two? You might be able to get four or five for ten dollars. Well, uh, now if you check the internet, you'll find places selling these eclipse glasses, probably for ten, fifteen, twenty. I remember four years ago, a few days before the eclipse, they were going for something like forty bucks a pop for one glass, for one glasses. And I can tell you also that down in Manhattan, at some of the camera stores in Manhattan, the big camera stores, I will not mention any names, but you know if you dial up one of those camera stores. Yeah, they're selling those glasses uh, at a price, an inflated price. Well, that's the, me, the American way, I guess. But in any case, if you have eclipse glasses, they can be useful tomorrow as well. So what happens when the moon is closer than it will be tomorrow? If it's closer, then that shadow has the ability to uh, actually reach the Earth, fall onto the Earth. And as we saw in 1999 over uh, Europe from the Mir space station, you actually can get a blotch of shadow, lunar shadow falling upon the Earth, producing a total eclipse of the sun. Now, I'm of a certain age, he said, and I can remember a Saturday afternoon in March of 1970, a long time ago, and the uh, path of a total eclipse crossed Mexico, went over Florida, the southeastern states and went out to sea at Norfolk, Virginia. And look at this. The path passed within 75 miles of New York. Oh, now I, you know, I, my, I know my, grand, uh, my grandfather or my mom would have taken me if I had asked them to. Can we see the total eclipse? Sure. What's 75 miles? Unfortunately, we owned a car. We did not own a boat. So I missed that total eclipse. And look how close it came. It came so close that well, 96% of the sun was covered by the moon from here in New York. You see that I mean, front page story in the next day's edition of the New York Times. Millions watch eclipse of the sun in clear sky and eerie twilight falls briefly here. And look, this picture at the bottom of the newspaper showing a Cub Scout group from Ossining, New York at the peak of the 96% eclipse at Coney Island. And see how it came out? Look, the, the, the kids here, all we could see is their silhouette. It got dark. It got dusky for a few minutes with all of that sun behind the moon. I really wish we could repeat that eclipse. I wish we could have an eclipse just like that. And hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Remember at the beginning of the talk, I said the exeglimos, the triple saros, the turning of the wheel, 54 years and 32 days, one or two days, uh, give, or, give or take, an eclipse that occurs in one part of the world will return. 54 years later to basically the same part of the globe. Well, let's see. That eclipse, which was so near to New York in 1970, let's add 54 years to that. That's 2024. Let's add 31 days, not 32. And that would give, what, one month and one day. So the eclipse in 1970 was March 7th. This eclipse in 2024 will be on April the 8th. And look, look the path of totality. It starts over Mexico. It moves up through Texas, Arkansas, into Missouri, on through the Ohio Valley, and on up into, well, look at this, upstate New York. Now, in 1970, recall, the eclipse path was out over the ocean. Couldn't do anything about that. But this eclipse path, not quite the same as 54 years ago, but still close to New York. Now, you can get to that totality path. You can drive into totality. Look at this. This black blotch, 120 miles wide. This is the footprint of the shadow. And that's the path of totality, which moves through northern Ohio, 
northwestern sections of Pennsylvania, on up into western New York and upstate New York. My goodness, New York State is going to host a total eclipse of the sun in just about three years. This blue line that you see here, that marks the center of the eclipse track. That is the point of greatest eclipse. If you're along that blue line, totality is going to last three minutes and 45 seconds. It's going to pass right over Buffalo. Buffalo Chamber of Commerce, by the way, is going to be using the eclipse to try to entice people to come to beautiful Buffalo. I think the only thing that would entice me to come to Buffalo would be a total eclipse. Passes just north of Rochester and right over Watertown, New York, and Plattsburgh, New York. This is the edge of totality right here near Ticonderoga and Rome and Syracuse, Penyan and Belmont. And here's where we are. And we're going to see 93% of the sun covered by the moon. And you'll say, well, Joe, Joe, 93%, Joe. That's certainly good enough, isn't it? See 93% of the sun covered? To which my answer would be to you, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. You want to knock out all of the sun because when you do, that's when the great show is visible. That is when you really and truly will get a chance to see a tremendous show, a total eclipse of the sun. So my question to you is, should you book a travel uh, to a place? If not New York, maybe further down track along the eclipse path in Kentucky or Arkansas or Texas or whatever. Should you book the travel to a place where the event in question lasts no more than three or four minutes? Uh, yes, yes, you should, because you're going to remember those moments for the rest of your life. As beautiful as tomorrow morning's partial eclipse will be, it is the total eclipse that is so phenomenal. The moon slowly moves between us and the sun. At first, there appears to be just a small bite. Then the bite gets larger and larger, and the sky begins to dim. You begin to know why this moment was so terrifying to early man. And now, as the last little bit of sunlight begins to disappear, it shines through the craters and mountains and valleys of the moon, it creates a diamond ring in the sky, followed a few seconds later by the cosmic vision of a lifetime, a total eclipse of the sun. The outer atmosphere of the sun is visible now. The incredible corona flashing out into the heavens, accompanied by ruby red tongues of hydrogen gas, which we call prominences. I'm going to play you now a short snippet of an audio of a man who I admired greatly, who was one of my mentors in astronomy. He was one of the senior lecturers at the Hayden Planetarium, Dr. Fred Hess. Fred was also a physical science professor at SUNY Maritime College, Fort Schuyler. You've seen that underneath the Throgs Neck Bridge. Well, he, in 1979, wanted to take his physical science class to witness a total eclipse. And they went. They went to Lundar, Manitoba in February. Oh, have you ever been to Manitoba in February? It's cold. And in fact, on the day of the eclipse, it was about 30 degrees below zero. Cold indeed. But nobody Nobody felt that cold weather. You know why? Because they were seeing the spectacle of a lifetime, a total eclipse of the sun. Now, you're going to hear on the audio I have here, uh, Dr. Hess, he had a deep, resonant voice, and he had seen many eclipses before. But listen to him. You know the old saying, it never gets old? With Fred, it never got old. When he saw totality, he screamed and yelled, just like all of the neophytes in his group to see that spectacular total eclipse of the sun, 1979.
This diamond is rising up 100,000 miles from the sun. All right, here we go. Here we go. Now it's time to put it on, though. Well, I think you get the idea that this event is more than just an event. Every fiber of you gets involved during those few moments of totality. Sadly, though, now the cosmic sequence reverses itself. The moon moves on and along its way. The sun is gradually uncovered. The total eclipse is over. And most people will not see another one probably in their life. Because most people probably will say, I'm going to wait until the next one that comes to my neighborhood. Well. In the New York City metropolitan area, the eclipse was uh, occurred on January 24th, 1925, a total eclipse of the sun. And you could see how it literally just, it was a showstopper. It stopped the city. Millions halted in their regular uh, schedule to gaze up at that beautiful, spectacular sight in the sky. Now, if you're sitting around at your home base and you're saying, I'm gonna wait until the next one comes around to here, the next time we're going to have a chance to see a total eclipse of the sun. Well, actually, on average, it happens once every 400 years. So if you see one, you'll have to wait maybe another four centuries to see another. That is an average, however, that's not exact or precise. And I'm happy to tell you, now here's the good news. The next time we're going to have a total eclipse of the sun over the New York metropolitan area will be on May 1st, it's a Tuesday now, in the year 2079. That's only 58 years from now. But I want you to also notice another thing. Look at the path of totality. The path of totality for this eclipse starts at sunrise. Right here at sunrise, New York City gets a total eclipse of the sun. You think tomorrow's eclipse is going to be special happening at sunrise and seeing four-fifths of the sun covered? Come back 58 years later in 2079, that first Tuesday in May, and you'll see the sun coming up, not like a big ball, not like a crescent, but that's how the sun will look at sunrise uh, in 2079. As I said, it's only, what, 58 years from now? So stick to your vitamins and do a lot of good wishing, but uh, so it goes. Anyway, that is, our, uh, that is our prep for your eclipse viewing pleasure tomorrow morning. I hope it's gonna be clear for us to see if not, we've got that total eclipse coming to us, New York State, in three years on April the 8th, 2024. And if you miss out on that, the only other way you're going to see a total eclipse is if you do some traveling. Uh, there's one actually later this year in December, a total eclipse of the sun. Do I hear anyone for Antarctica? <laughs> I don't think so. So that is, our, that is our talk. And I thank all of you for listening to me blither for the last uh, hour and five minutes or so. Back to you, Julie.